Um, well, first off, I want to apologize for my voice. It's a little raspy. Um, the conference circuit is a little new to me. Um, but anyway, my name is Lindsay Kelleher, and I'm one of the senior policy managers at the Blockchain Association. Um, so for today's discussion, we're going to be talking about an issue that has been touched upon and mentioned, but will be the sole focus of this panel, and that is privacy policy. So during today's panel, we'll trace the origins of privacy um, and their impact on cri the crypto ecosystem and um, other technological developments in the U.S., including cryptographic encryption. Um, but before we begin, I just want to go down the line of each of our panelists and have them give a brief intro. So we'll start with Gabrielle. Hi everyone, my name is Gabrielle Hibbert. I am a fellow at the Decentralized Future Council where our mission and goal is to educate policymakers and the general public on public interest uh, uh, use cases of blockchain. Outside of that, I am a professional keyboard toucher, uh, otherwise known as a software developer. I work with smart contracts and privacy enhancing technologies. And outside of that, I am a lecturer at uh, Brandeis University and the College of the William and Mary. Mike? Sure. I'm Michael Mosier, um, General Counsel at Espresso Systems, which is building configurable, scalable privacy for digital assets. Um, like you heard before, I was previously the acting director of FinCEN and deputy director and a bunch of other stuff in the government, um, mainly at the Department of Justice as well, deputy chief of the money laundering section and at the White House National Security Council all focused on countering exploitation, which is very much what we're about to talk about today, so. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Kern Opsel. I'm the Deputy Executive Director and General Counsel at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, the leading uh, organization fighting for your digital rights, so privacy, free expression, innovation, trying to uh, help the policy legal environment that will help us build uh, a future that we want to live in. Awesome, thank you so much. We're, I feel lucky to be on this couch with these esteemed panelists, so very exciting. Um, let's dive in. Um, and I think the best place to start is really at the beginning. So, Gabrielle, can you talk to us about the origins of privacy? When we think about a U.S. citizen's right to privacy, what does that mean, and how has that been incorporated into the U.S. Constitution and other U.S. laws, particularly and probably most relevant for all of us, the Bank Secrecy Act, which was created in the 1970s? Yeah, definitely. So I do want to first say that I am not uh, an attorney or legally trained like my two uh, co-panelists right here, uh, but I do like to start off the conversation on privacy policy with the uh, amazing Harvard Law Brief by Warren and Brandeis called The Right to Privacy, published in 1890. It is an amazing text if you haven't gotten a chance to read it. It really kind of frames this discussion around the need to have a policy framework that focuses on privacy. Uh, so far in the kind of legal framework of the United States, there was uh, a huge emphasis on protecting physical property. And the kind of impetus to uh, this entire discussion around the the kind of liminal space that privacy takes up was the uh, flash photography uh, that uh, was invading the privacy of Warren and Brandeis. And if you are to kind of take that uh, conversation a little bit further, I think we're still seeing these discussions today in terms of how and where we broker our personally identifiable information. Uh, these are conversations that I have routinely with my students and with people out in the public, and I think we really need to kind of figure out how best to slot in verifying uh, individuals' credentials while also protecting their sensitive and most personal uh, information. Uh, in regards to kind of the development over to the Bank Secrecy Act, I will say that uh, we can definitely debate on whether or not the brief that was written was considered in the establishment of the BSA, but I think the conversation should be kind of focused on how we can use the great methods of applied cryptography, uh, mainly zero knowledge proofing systems that started around the 1980s, where we can essentially uh, have a statement, kind of prove the validity of that statement without revealing the statement itself. Now it sounds kind of like magic, 
uh, but these uh, zero knowledge proofing systems have been used in everything from cryptocurrencies to self-sovereign identity. So I think right there, <laughs> we can kind of not throw the baby out with the bathwater, but have verifying uh, apparatuses while also holding tight uh, our privacy. Awesome, thanks so much, Gabrielle. So now we've talked about the origins of privacy and how that figures factors into the BSA. I wanna shift now two decades to the 90s. The internet has come on the scene and cryptographic encryption has been introduced, much to the chagrin of many regulators and US government. Um, Kurt, you played a prominent role in making sure that encryption was legal, permissible, and in many cases, commonplace in the digital, in the digital lives of US citizens. Can you talk about some of the legal and policy battles that you had to go through um, during the crypto wars and sort of what was, what was privacy, how was privacy before the crypto wars and what did it look like after? Uh, absolutely. So I, I think you know, so I'm a, a veteran of, of the crypto wars, though they actually did start uh, before I, I joined uh, e EFF. They've been going on for a long time. 25 years ago, EFF had a case, US versus Bernstein, uh, which was about the publication of an open source software program that allowed for strong cryptography. It was called Snuffle, it was published online, and because it was published online, that could be seen and copied and then run overseas. And at the time, cryptography was classified as a munition, as something, a dual use technology, but something that was being regulated for its export. Uh, and we made the assertion and succeeded in the courts to show that code is speech. Code is a form of expression that is subject to the protections of uh, the, you know, the First Amendment, and by publishing Snuffle, which had strong encryption, that was an expressive message, and this prohibition on publishing it online, which could lead to potential export, was unconstitutional. And since then, there have been a number of cases that have established pretty clearly at this point that code is speech, and that has enabled encryption to, to exist, to proliferate, though, that was sort of the first crypto war and it was established, okay, this is, this is good. And there was a bit of a low, but then as technology improved, encryption became more and more commonplace, becoming default in messaging programs. You know, uh, iMessage uh, made it default between iMessage to iMessage communications. WhatsApp uh, made it uh, uh, for two billion people with uh, a flip of a switch adopting the Signal protocol. Signal has also become very popular. And this made a lot of governments nervous, and they wanted to do something about that, and that's where the second part of the crypto wars came about, where they're trying to find ways to put in a backdoor. Though eventually they learned that backdoor was a bad word. And so uh, you'll never see them uh, these days calling it a backdoor. They're like, have as much encryption as you want, so long as we still have plain text access. So what, what has this done? Like, how has this affected the privacy before then and today? Well. It has done amazing things for giving people a technological protection. We can also have you know, legal and policy protections, but a second level is technological protection for your privacy. And you know, during the early days of the web, pretty much everything was in the open. When encryption first started rolling out, it was just for you know, using your credit cards at an e-commerce site or a few uh, you know, cypherpunks who wanted to do it for their own websites. But nowadays, almost every website is encrypted when you communicate to it. And Billions and billions of messages are encrypted end to end as you talk to other people. So we have that backstop, these privacy enhancing technologies. And one of the things that's really important about privacy, privacy is a fundamental right, but it's also a right that enables other rights. It enables your freedom of expression, to be able to organize your freedom of association, to be able to support organizations that will advocate for you. That's both the, the, the association and then a way of expressing yourself. And without that private space, without that right to be left alone, without someone looking over your shoulders, it's hard to effectuate your other rights. And so this has become a, a new world where there has been a, a lot of things to be able to have the kind of private conversations. Now, getting back to like, how was it before then? In the olden days, you could go to a payphone to make a communication and unless someone was very prepared in advance, they couldn't listen in. You could talk to someone on the street and no one was around to hear it. In this modern age where so much of our stuff is done online with third parties and such, it has become a golden age of surveillance. And that's why we need this technological backstop to make sure that it's a fight against mass surveillance, that you have to look at you, get a warrant, go after that information, 
do it through lawful processes instead of just looking at the bits as they go across the wire. And this comes again, bring it to the uh, the cryptocurrency world, blockchain. We'll be talking about this, I think, some more. But uh, you know, uh, there are privacy enhancing technologies that are being built into blockchain, open source products. These are things that should be protected as code is speech and should be encouraged to give this technological privacy backed up. That we need privacy enhancing technologies in order to effectuate and protect our rights. Awesome. I am personally in complete agree with, men, with you, and I think many in this room are as well. Um, so let's fast forward now. We've talked about the original crypto wars. Now let's fast forward to modern times, to what I'm calling the World War II of the crypto wars. Um, and let's turn to Mike. So as a former regulator, can you talk about the way that um, privacy factors into you know, policy considerations, um, especially when an issue has a national security nexus? So, say for example, the sanctioning of Tornado Cash because of their, uh, because of its interactions with the um, DP DPRK. Yeah, sure. No, I think it's uh, I actually think it's very helpful to, that you framed it too in, in terms of both the national security but also the policymaker decision making, um, because as Kurt was saying, there's there are uh, even the national security apparatus and and everybody that's sort of handling protecting Americans uh, from foreign threats, which include the DPRK and Russian hackers, um, come hacking the election, um, everything that we've already seen. There's certainly an appreciation for cryptography that we need to prevent victims. Um, I think the, the, the concern in the tornado cash space to some degree was, okay, but we also have this autocratic government that's, that's, that seems to be laundering billions of dollars, what do we do about it? Um, and I think there, that's a question of, and Gabrielle was talking about this already, like what are the technological solutions that you can use to minimize risk that is not going to be a back, create a back door, um, which is a clear and obvious vulnerability. Um, I mean, it's became a bad word on purpose <laughs> because I think everybody agrees um, creating vulnerabilities also creates the vulnerabilities for people to be hacked by Russian state government. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, I, I think it's, I mean, I, I really see the tornado cash sanctions in, the, in a national security lens, not a privacy technology lens. Mm -hmm. I would not have chosen sanctions. I think it was, a, it was, there was way too much collateral impact from that. Mm -hmm. And there's probably other ways, including exclusion proofs um, and, and other ways to mitigate that from a technological standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's keeping it, keeping things in that conversational realm that Kurt was describing, where people understand that we, we have to protect people. Mm -hmm. um, and that includes preventing victims, not just chasing bad guys after. Awesome. So now that we've we've sort of gotten the lay of the privacy land, I really want to dive into the meat here and talk about these technical solutions and what policies can be implemented to sort of facilitate them being incorporated into these blockchain crypto networks. Um, so I want to turn now to um, Mike and let, or Gabrielle, I'm sorry. Can you talk a little bit about some of the work that you're, and advocacy that you're doing at the Decentralized Future Council um, and how privacy factors into that? Um, and, you know, because of this um, connection with Web3, do you think that privacy has a space in Web3 and, and how can it be preserved more effectively than it currently is being preserved? Yeah, definitely. So I think, uh, to kind of go to your original question, as I said before, the Decentralized Future Council is really built on education. So my role currently, I am the Security and Privacy Fellow, and my goal is to really educate uh, what privacy means in context. And what I mean by that is each of us come from various uh, contexts as it relates to privacy. I come from an immigrant background, and I view privacy a little bit differently than, say, my two panelists right here. And kind of taking that framework to address the very real need to have it uh, included as a human right for all is the way in which I kind of move this uh, through line to accepting that, you know, privacy is something that everyone should hold very dear and something that we should continue to fight for. Uh, in terms of wider kind of educational goals outside of uh, talking to people about what privacy is, it's really just educating uh, the different methods that everyday people can engage in to protect their personal information. Uh, whether that is as simple as uh, using a VPN or even using a friendlier browser 
like DuckDuckGo or Firefox. Uh, those are the kind of tiny steps that uh, we at the council are doing. In context to Web3, I really like to kind of uh, go back to what Kurt was saying. Uh, many of the companies uh, that are in this room right now, uh, we were built from the cypherpunk revolution of the 70s and 80s. We have uh, kind of the knowledge built from people like David Chom, who uh, developed eCash and is now a huge uh, proponent of a private CBDC to the ethical hacker, St. Jude. Uh, a lot of these folks from that era really uh, championed the need to have a private distributed networking future. So I think really the, the biggest thing is we kind of, uh, kind of uh, continue forward in the Web3 space is to not forget that that helped build the industry that we work in today. So that's super helpful, thank you. Um, so let's go a little bit more granular now and let's get into DeFi more specifically. Um, so Mike, now we're kind of switching over your role now at Expresso. Um, hopefully you can talk from that lens as well. Um, and you, can you talk about some of the challenges that privacy faces is in the DeFi ecosystem? And do you think that the government is gonna take more action um, to, to, I guess, restrict privacy um, within the ecosystem? Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think the big challenge that we're seeing right now, partly because so much is exposed on public ledgers, is how do you protect uh, for people from having everything be exposed so that you now have, you're creating targets. I mean, I think from a law enforcement perspective, it's, it's obvious that you don't want to be creating targets like that. Um, but the question is, how do you prevent these sort of low probability, high imp impact events like DPRK laundering sort of billions of dollars? And I think that's where, um, I think to get ahead of that, we need to find ways to, to, to manage risk as much as possible because if you look at sort of what brings a regulator into the space, it's large amounts of risk that, and this goes back to the earlier comment about policymakers, that a policymaker goes to OFAC or the National Security Council goes to OFAC or FinCEN or someone and says, this is billions of dollars, you must act now, rush into it, hurry up, um, there's collateral impact, that's okay, we need to take action now. And I think that's the risk that, that partly worries me the most, that you sort of, you have these high impact events that are rushed through, that sort of calcify into precedent over time as people move on, as people get further from the event, and, and you get what are what otherwise I think would be considered an exception. I mean, we had this sort of post 9-11 with the Patriot Act too, but, but like, you know, people act quickly at the time, it's 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 an exception. Like, well, we normally wouldn't take an action that would that would have maybe 70 to 80 percent of the users were not identifiably illicit. That's too much collateral impact. But here, it's billions, and we got to act, and it's North Korea. And then it suddenly, it, over time, becomes a precedent. Potentially, is code not speech in certain in forms, or this is just a national security exception, uh, and it sort of drifts out from there. So I think part of it is like. How much can we manage risk in privacy-preserving ways, whether it's through zero-knowledge proofs, exclusion proofs, um, there's, there's a lot of ways to do that, and activity-based risk that has nothing to do with identity, um, that allows more people in, more frictionless transfer, um, but also we're mitigating risk ourselves so that the regulators can sort of worry about all the other problems. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and you bring up code as speech, and I feel like that is something that I've heard argued on both sides that code is speech, but then I've also heard, well, it's maybe not actually, you know, and I think you kind of brought that up. So, Kurt, could you comment on that a little bit and, and maybe build that out a little bit more? A absolutely, and of course, I strongly believe the code is, in fact, speech. <laughs> I think the courts agree. Uh, but I, I have heard this as, as a tension, and one of, the, one of the points of tension is distinguishing as between, like, the sort of the source code, the, you know, which is uh, human-readable, expressive, and then the functionality. And in, in my view, and, and uh, also the, the view of some, some courts, that this is, this is how it works, is, is that it is still speech. It is protected by the First Amendment. But keep in mind, the First Amendment, despite it being, you know, Congress shall make no law, nevertheless, it has evolved to be that, except when it's really necessary to pass these various tests, uh, which is, these are actually very good tests. They, you know, they go to a level of scrutiny, sometimes it's strict scrutiny uh, for content-based speech or content-based regulations. You have intermediate scrutiny. But one of the key aspects of this is that it's not the end of the conversation when, when something is speech. You just have to say, is it 
uh, narrowly tailored? Is it you know, doing more damage than it needs to be? Is there an important government purpose here? And I think that you know, if we look at like the tornado cash situation, there was a lot of collateral. It was not narrowly tailored. It was a broad brush. And so this is where that it still is, has to go through the test, but I you know, think it would, wouldn't pass the test. The, uh, so this is where the functionality of the code is. is something that while considering this test, you look at the functionality. That is part of the analysis, but it is still speech. And I think where a lot of the conversation goes, well, I don't think code is, is speech because it's functional, is they're thinking it's a, like a binary and it's either one or the other, mm -hmm. and it can be both, right? It is both the, the code itself, the expression that's inherent in, in, in the uh, source code, but part of what you are trying to express with a privacy-enhancing technology is that you want to have a more private world and have that, that available to people. Like it is part of the thing that you are trying to express, not just writing it up like a poem, but writing it up as something that can be useful, that can defend the values that you're supporting and that you're expressing. So you have to consider the functionality as part of the message. That's super helpful, and I feel like clarifies it for me a little bit, too, so I appreciate that. Um, well, now I want to pivot to AML CFT laws in the U.S., um, and I think we, you know, I think you called it the golden age of surveillance. Um, can we talk a little bit about these U.S. AML CFT laws and, and their applicability to crypto, and, and, you know, how can they be updated in a way that will provide privacy, but also ensure that there's a, that, that necessary balance being drawn for, with national security. Um, and maybe we can just talk, go through all three of you. Yeah, um, as a non-attorney on this, <laughs> this panel, I am definitely going to defer to my two panelists. But I think, again, there's a way to have both. I think having a way to preserve people's privacy while verifying what needs to be verified is a middle ground that we can take. And I'll uh, give it over to you all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, partly in itself was, was working on this the past couple of years. Um, you know, one of the things we did when I was there was have set up a privacy initiative that invited zero knowledge proofs and homomorphic encryption experts in to say, to actually push industry, the AML industry, to say, we really want you to do this in a more privacy preserving way. Every time more personal identifiable information is sent around to various banks and, and other service providers that could leak it. You create vulnerabilities. There's millions and millions and millions of PII out there on the, on the web um, to the point where there's so much credential stuffing and synthetic identity that actually even doing identity-based risk management is, is questionable at this point. Um, and so part of it was like, let's find other ways of doing this. That's fun. Let's actually prevent victims instead of chasing bad guys all the time. Um, and I think that and bringing on someone that was an expert in digital identity was also part of that. We put out a notice of proposed rulemaking that said we'd like to modernize the AML. What what could we do? What could we do to make this more priority based instead of just collection? Mm -hmm. um, and we even had the, you know fintech places that said, oh, well, we were happy to just we'd love to not file SARS or do anything. Can mm -hmm. we just set up an API and you can just see all our stuff? And we're like, no, <laughs> I don't want all your stuff. <laughs> we don't want to collect, I mean, we don't want to create, the point is not, the mission is preventing exploitation. Mm -hmm. the, there's tools that involve, involve information collection that also, like everything else, have drifted over time. Mm -hmm. um, but actually FinCEN itself, despite what some members of Congress might say, was saying, actually, we'd love this to be a lot more privacy preserving and not data dumping. And like, let's prevent victims because we're never ever going to make a victim whole again. Mm -hmm. Like we can chase bad guys all we want, but the feeling of exploitation and vulnerability is not going to go away. Mm -hmm. So let's prevent it on the front end. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I think uh, one, one of the things we, we talked about a little bit to here, but zero knowledge proofs. And I think that this uh, provides an excellent opportunity to do things that are privacy pre preserving and yet give some space for legitimate law enforcement interests. And this has always been a tension between law enforcement interests and the uh, privacy uh, of individuals. And as a, as a uh, society, we've decided here in the United States, at least under the Fourth Amendment, that like there was strong regulatory rules in the Fourth Amendment that you have to have you know, probable cause, you have to uh, have a good reason to go after and invade into a, a private space. Um, and so if we can find it so that there was a way where only the information 
that it was necessary to, to show that this was a, a lawful transaction was provided, but the rest of the information was kept private, like this could be a great step forward. But sort of putting that, that aside, like also just talking on the, on the legal end of it, I want to make a, a mention of the, the key doctrine that is at play for a lot of this, which is the third party doctrine. This is a, a legal doctrine uh, that says that uh, uh, if you've given your information to a third party, you have given up some of your privacy interest in that, and so that it may be obtained uh, without, uh, without a warrant. And, uh, and, and a couple years back, there was a very important Supreme Court decision, the Carpenter case, that put a limit on the third party doctrine, which had been one of the main things that, that the government was using to be able to get warrantless access to often communications, but other records that were held by third parties. Uh, and they said, well, they were not going to extend it to uh, location from your, from your cell phone, even though you know, it was held by a uh, you know, phone company, a third party. And this was a very important crack in that doctrine. And why is this super important? Because we live now in a world where all of your information is being held by, by third parties. You know, it used to be that you, know, you would write a letter to someone, it was temporarily, and they had to close up, there were special rules about that, it goes to the other, or you could hand them something they had in their house, but now you have it in cloud storage, you are using cloud services. So much of our lives is in the hands of third parties. So if we want to have strong privacy protection, uh, that where this requires someone has to come prove to a judge that there's something worthwhile here and come in with a warrant, then we need to address the third party doctrine and ratchet it back even further. So I, I have been hopeful that the Carpenter uh, decision will help with that. I think we have some work to do before we get there, but it, is, it was a good start. Yeah, and, and just building off that, you know, um, Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor has even mentioned that the third party doctrine needs to be updated. And, you know, this conversation has, has made me think of the FinCEN files and, and sort of that expose on just how ineffective and privacy, um, you know, deteriorating our AML CFT um, system is here in the US. Um, what updates other than, I guess, how would you propose to update you know, the third party doctrine and, and the CTR and SAR reporting requirements so that they're more amenable to individual privacy. Um, and do you think the regulators will bite? Do you think they'll be in, they'll be supportive of these sort of updates? And I, we can go down the line too. <laughs> well, I'll say from a developer's perspective, people uh, like me, we want kind of clear guidelines on how we can develop this type of technology. Uh, I think that's been one of the biggest anxieties uh, that has kind of surfaced within this space and within the community that, that I work in, uh, which is very interesting as we kind of talk about the general privacy anxiety that we feel with the kind of uh, leveraging and brokering of our personal data. So I think there's, definitely has to be a kind of conversation, a, a two-way conversation between uh, those in the technical development field and regulators to get to a, a nice happy medium. I, I think that that's, that's a perfect place for me to pick up. I mean, I, I think part of it is, in terms of all the regulators, I don't know if I can speak for them, certainly not the SEC, um, but I can speak for FinCEN, and I, and I think we've explicitly said here's a notice of proposed rulemaking to modernize the BSA, like give us feedback, you know, we'd like to do that. There's a certain, you know, the Bank Secrecy Act is a statute of Congress, so there's a limit to how much as a regulator you can change. And I think part of that is, as Gabrielle said, is building the technology that, that makes the third party doctrine sort of less relevant mm -hmm. because you're end to end encrypting data to begin with. You're protecting the data it's not going all over the place. Mm -hmm. And then, because the point is, you, I think you don't want to be beholden to high impact events that can change things yeah. really rapidly. Uh, you know, like Myanmar was ruled by a military junta that was doing horrendous things. Then Aung San Suu Kyi came back and everyone's like, oh, we're good now. And now it's back the other way. It's like, no, we're not good anymore. <laughs> um, and you, so you don't want to be just reliant on democracy. I mean, the constitution is fantastic but I don't want to wait for something to go all the way through the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think part of it is like building the technology that allows people to have this protection and to manage some risk through zero knowledge and other ways of doing it, but so that you're like, yes, 
changing, creating more privacy, less identity-based, you know, as a policy matter, but I think it has to also be a technical solution so that we're not just relying on people to follow rules. Mm -hmm. We're actually protecting people proactively. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, going, going through the Supreme Court to change the third-party doctrine, I mean, that is a, a lengthy process. The, the, the wheels of justice sometimes turn slowly in the court system, though they do turn. <laughs> And I, I hope that we will, we will get there, but uh, uh, that's just one of the reasons why, you know, we, having privacy-enhancing technologies uh, can be very helpful. And I'm glad you, you mentioned sort of end-to-end -end encryption, because one of the, the solutions, if you're putting things into the cloud and you want to have some of the protections of, you know, the, the warrant requirement, is if you hold the keys, then there's an encrypted blob on, on the cloud, and, you know, they can, they can get that pursuant to the third-party tracking, perhaps, but they still have to talk to you to get to the get to the keys and come to your place to get the, with a warrant, and this enables due process. And I think that's what we're trying to get at. I mean, we recognize that there are governments have legitimate interests in uh, you know, enforcing laws, and but they should also go through a, a due process. Mm -hmm. And in, in many cases, it, that due process requires that the the person being targeted have an opportunity to raise their their objection, raise their their legal arguments. Mm -hmm challenge the, the, the third party doctrine. And if, if things happen without your knowledge, without your ability to, to do anything about it, we are losing some of that due process. Awesome. So I think final question for the day, and I think we have touched, in, touched on it a little bit, but I just want to build it out a little more. What can industry be doing to prioritize privacy and, and really to, to build an ecosystem where individuals don't have to worry about getting doxxed when, you know, court documents get sent out and, um, you know, they can really transact in a very private, secure manner? Yeah, I think something that is a, a very low lift, uh, what Michael was mentioning a couple of minutes ago, is do you need to have that data? I think that's a question that I always ask uh, my team when we're kind of building things out is, do we really need that? What, what purpose does that serve for the actual uh, output and use of this particular piece of technology that we're building? So I think you know, outside of getting into the weeds of the regulatory discussion, uh, I think industry needs to kind of peel back the, the layers on, on what exactly are they offering uh, to customers and how can they kind of scale it back to not have to kind of broker out their data for ad revenue, right? So I think changing that model uh, within industry would be would be fantastic to see. Mike? Yeah, no, I agree. I think the biggest thing we can do industry-wise is to is create that end-to-end -end encryption in a seamless user-centric way that is going to make it easy, like DuckDuckGo mm -hmm. has done and others, um, that it's not downloading a Docker container and doing command line interface um, to, to, in order to move something, but it's like it's an app and it works um, so that you don't have the leakage out there. Um, and then I think... There's a lot of incredible privacy-preserving risk management tools out there that doesn't create such a risk that, that you, you have people on the hill clamoring and telling agencies, you need to act right now and really fast. Kurt, last words? Yeah, these, are, these are great uh, ideas so far, and I, I agree. Uh, so, you know, as the people who are innovating and developing the technologies here, think about the user, put the user first, and keep, them, keep it secret, keep it safe. Make sure that they know that their, their information is protected, not just from, you know, uh, I, you, but you can do that. Protected from hackers, so I have to keep it secure. Uh, build privacy in by design, keeping the minimum amount of it for the minimum amount of time. And if there is somebody who's coming for that information, uh, if they're coming with a subpoena, make sure you give notice to people so they can fight that, that subpoena. If, and if you can fight that, Yourself, if you're given a secrecy order that you're not allowed to tell someone about it, still fight it yourself. But putting the users in front, giving them the confidence that you'll have their back and that you've designed something that's going to provide that strong protection, that they can feel like it's comfortable to be here. And I also just really want to echo the importance of usability to have this, these protections be available to all people. It has to be usable by all people. And that means that people who are not very technically sophisticated, who might be using a phone several generations behind or don't have access to high bandwidth, make sure that everybody can take advantage of these companies and we have privacy for the whole world. 
Well, this was such a great conversation. I feel so honored to have been even been a part of it. Um, well, thank you so much. And that concludes our privacy conversation.